The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Are you making the most of your KiwiSaver investment? Generate is an award-winning KiwiSaver provider with a track record of strong long-term performance. Making a smart decision now could add tens of thousands of dollars by the time you reach retirement. Book a no-obligation chat with a Generate KiwiSaver advisor today at generatekiwisaver.co.nz slash advice. A copy of the product disclosure statement is available at generatekiwisaver.co.nz. The issuer of the scheme is Generate Investment Management Limited, and of course, past performance does not guarantee future returns. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. How to get 30, 30, bit to get 30, bit to get 20, 20, 20, bit to get 20, 20, bit to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month? So Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. No, my hi to my. This is Toby Manhai. This is not Bernard Hickey, but we do have Bernard Hickey with us today for a very special 2022 Budget Day crossover event in the spin off cinematic universe, the Jason versus Freddie of New Zealand podcasting. Uh, it's uh, gone by lunch, the facts change. Uh, Bernard Hickey is coming <laughs> at us uh, direct from where are you, Bernard? You look, are you somewhere in the, in the press gallery dungeons? Actually, no, in the, in the beehive around the corner from the banquet hall where we were locked up for three hours. Yes. Just not, just close to the beehive theatreette. Um, so off the, off the beaten track slightly, but, um, plenty of carpet and low ceilings to avoid sounding like I'm in a toilet. And you were in the lockup there in the beehive since I think 10.30 this morning and that's everybody starts to, Go a bit. I don't know what happens in there. I've never been in one, but people always emerge looking slightly different, as though they've been implanted in some way. You've been absorbed in that budget. <laughs> Tell us what you, when you zoom out, the wide-angled view on budget 2022. Yeah, well, this is my 14th uh, uh, budget lockup in a row, mm. and I even did some in the 1990s. So after a while, it all becomes a bit of a blur, and budgets these days really are not about any big change in policy, even though the 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 big lead-up to it implies, oh, we're going to get some big news today, mm. or there's big some big spending announcement. But actually, because of the way that governments have limited themselves to making sure that net debt is always going to be below a certain level, it essentially means that governments' hands are, they've, well, they've tied their own hands mm. when it comes to spending on infrastructure or dealing with some of the basic problems we've got with uh, housing affordability and climate change and child poverty. And yet again, this is a budget where the government could have done an awful lot but chose not to, to ensure that it kept uh, debt low and, most importantly, interest rates low so that homeowners will get all of the juicy tax-free leveraged capital gains that they have come to expect. Hmm. Uh, And the thing that everyone was talking about in the lead-up to Budget Day, not just in New Zealand but around the world, is cost of living, the cost of living crisis the real immediate effects uh, in people's pockets. So it was inevitable there was going to be something there, wasn't there, and it's come in the form of a $350 cash payment, not quite not quite helicopter money, but a direct kind of injection of cash into, I think this is saying, as many as 2 million people's pockets. Uh, for anyone who earns under $70,000 and isn't getting the winter energy payment, that's a real, they're really targeting the squeezed middle there, right? That's right. This this has the words squeezed middle mm. written all over it. Mm. And it's a response to the uh, opposition's argument that those people who aren't getting much help from working for families or accommodation supplement or didn't get an increase in their benefits on April the, one, April the 1st mm. are, um, are missing out somehow and that they're being squeezed by higher energy and food costs. Although actually when you look at the squeezed middle claim, those people who own their own homes are actually doing just fine and have actually mm. put $20 billion in cash in the bank. So um, it is a response to that and it's very targeted and short term. So Treasury will be happy because they haven't just added a big new cost every year. Mm. It's a one-off costing about $800 million. And uh, you're right, it is limited to those people who aren't getting the winter energy payment and are earning less than 70K. So it's a 
it's a bit of a sprinkling of a few things here and there. It's not a flood of cash. And that's mm. the problem here. The government wanted to give some cash to people who, who, uh, who say they need it, mm. but also didn't want to give too much cash. Otherwise, it'd be accused of um, splashing the cash and pushing up inflation pressures uh, again. Yeah. And we're talking now at about half past two. So the debate is going on in the House of Representatives. But I would wager that one of the things that is going to be said by the opposition leaders is this is inflationary. That's the danger, right? That, that, that you add further to inflation and then you've got in the UK at the moment, for example, they're starting to talk about stagflation, which is, of course, when you have uh, inflation going up but uh, the economy isn't growing. Is that the kind of conversation that this is going to lead to or no? Yeah, well, the, the opposition have been saying this for months now, that the government is splashing the cash and pushing up inflation. But actually, when you look at the detail of this budget, and I asked the um, finance minister about this, mm. was it a tightening or a loosening? Mm. And it's clear from the Treasury figures, that this is actually a tighter budget. When you look at the what they call the fiscal impulse, so how much money is being pumped into the economy mm. net, or how much money is being pulled out of the economy net, by the government. And over the next three years, the government's actually going to be pulling out of the economy around about three and a half percentage points of GDP. So this is upwards of $20 billion in cash is being pulled out. Mm. And the way that the government does that is in effect through fiscal creep. Remember, we've got an economy with high inflation, so it's upwards of 7% at the moment, plus some growth on top, which means that nominal GDP is growing at uh, almost uh, double-digit rates. Now, that, 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 that may not mean much to most people, but what it means mm. is that people's incomes are growing quite quickly, they're jumping up the income tax thresholds, and before you know it, the tax revenues coming into the government's coffers are actually rising faster than the economy and even faster than wages. And this is part of the, the complaints and the tactic the opposition have used, which is, ah, you could help the squeeze middle by uh, changing the tax thresholds and that would help everyone. The government hasn't um, given up the ghost on uh, keeping the cre fiscal creep because it's blinking useful to get mm. yourself back into surpl surplus. But I suspect next year it will be untenable for the government to keep fiscal creeping its way to a surplus and they'll have to do some sort of adjustment of those thresholds. It does seem like one of those things that at some point a bipartisan agreement needs to be reached because it's illusory, right, isn't it? Because in real terms, we're not earning more, but we end up coughing up more tax. So there's a, there, there, at, at some point pegging that to, I don't know, what would you pick it to, CPI or something? Yeah, um, you'd link it to um, growth in household disposable income in some sort of uh, uh, indexed way, mm. in the same way that people have talked about um, indexing the retirement age for New Zealand superannuation to the um, uh, the the average um, you know lifespan of people. However, the beauty of just holding your thresholds at one point is that you in effect get a tax increase without having to ask for it. Yep. And if you're a government that is very nervous about asking voters for a tax increase, mm. an automated tax increase like this is, is very helpful. And it's not just Na Labor who are doing this. National did this too. And uh, and remember we had those debates way back in the days of Michael Cullen about you know blocks of cheese. We, mm. we go back there every time. It makes sense to have some sort of automated system which adjusts thresholds and line with disposable income. But um, for a government who wants to uh, get back into surplus fast, then having fixed thresholds is the way to do it. Mm. You mentioned blocks of cheese. And uh, again, who knows what's happening right now in the parliamentary debate. Maybe someone is holding aloft a kilogram <laughs> of uh, Tasty or Colby because the cost of living crisis for people uh, in their day-to-day -day lives is mostly <laughs> experienced or in, in large part experienced on a trip to the supermarket where you kind of immediately see those those inflationary pressures playing out right in front of you. One of the other things that was announced in the budget today, I think they're going to legislate under urgency once they've done this uh, cash payment thing, tonight even, is a change in the law around covenants essentially trying to stop land banking for supermarkets. Yeah, this was, uh, a, you know, a headline move, which I think a lot of people will go, gee, they're really serious about it. They're doing something really big here. Mm. But um, when you scrape below the surface, it's clear it's performative. 
So the government needs to be seen to be doing something to beat up those nasty supermarkets and stop them from uh, from uh, uh, locking out the competition. Yeah. However, um, and and these covenants are bad. It was one of the real achievements of the Commerce Commission's market study to to lift the lid on how many chunks of land had been locked off from from competitors mm. that were just growing grass and didn't have a, a juicy supermarket on it. However, as soon as the Commerce Commission uncovered these covenants, both of the big chains fessed up and said, "Oh, oh yeah, oh these covenants are well." We, we won't use them. We guarantee you we won't um, exercise these covenants again. Mm. So the government changing the law to effectively ban the supermarkets from using these covenants is in effect just um, uh, catching up with what the supermarkets have said they're already going to do. And also it might be quite difficult to carve out the supermarkets here. Remember, these are covenants on, um, on legal contracts mm. and you'd have to be very use some fancy footwork to carve out the supermarkets because there are a whole bunch of other people who've got covenants on bits of land all over the place and uh, it could be quite a blunt instrument if you just remove covenants altogether. I mean, for those um, uh, uh, people, the Yimbis, they'd be quite happy to get rid of all the covenants on all the land. Mm. <laughs> that would be one mm. way to solve the the, um, uh, the NIMBY problem. But uh, that's why I think this might be one of these bits of legislation that flies through in the dead of night and then when everyone... Uh, looks at, at the at the fine print. They go, oh, maybe we didn't actually achieve much there, and maybe we actually created more problems than we were trying to solve. I'm Toby Manhire, and this is Juggernaut: The Story of the Fourth Labour Government, a podcast in six parts. Doesn't give my opponents much time to run up a total election, does it? This nation is at risk. What do you think you're up to now, you perverted little liar? I can smell the uranium on it as you lean towards the <laughs> There's radical overhaul in the history of New Zealand's administration. Juggernaut: The Story of the Fourth Labour Government, made with the support of New Zealand on air. Listen now on the spin-off or wherever you get your podcast. Do you find it hard staying optimistic with all the financial news in the media? I'm Bernard Hickey, and on my podcast, When the Facts Change, I'm here to help you navigate the ever-changing landscape of economics in Aotearoa. So join the conversation every Friday on When the Facts Change, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network in partnership with KiwiBee. Kia ora, I'm Duncan Grieve, founder of The Spin-Off. You can help us keep all of The Spin-Off's award-winning journalism free for everybody by becoming a member today at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. One of the uh, big banner items that Grant Robertson was trailing in the weeks leading up to the budget was health, of course, and that's a really big ticket item in this budget because... We've of course got to deal with I think all the all the all the debt from the various DHBs that are being that are being shut down needs to be dealt with, as well as all the other costs involved in creating this new uh, single health agency, Health New Zealand, and alongside it, the Māori Health Authority. And what did we learn there, Bernard? Both in terms of the, you know the money that was being put in, but also what it might tell us about where. Health NZ and the Māori Health Authority sit respectively. Yeah, I actually think this was the really big piece of bad news out of the budget. Mm. The big numbers are going to the overall health authority, $1.8 billion in funding in the first year and then $1.3 billion in the second year. However, the Māori Health Authority is only getting $186 million over four years Mm. to commission uh, various health services uh, for Māori. Remember, Māori make up 16% of the population, but when you look at that $168 million, that's less than 2% of the extra $11 billion overall that is going into the health sector over the next four years. So um, almost immediately the reaction was really, really grumpy mm. from uh, those uh, reporters who have covered the sector for a long time and were hoping that the number going to the Māori Health Authority to commission services would be in the billions and in the end, we're talking 20, 30, 40 million dollars a year for the next four years. It's peanuts. Mm. And 
the uh, questions going towards uh, Penny Henare and uh, Grant Roberts were pretty hostile, and their answer was that um, you know it's going to take a while for the Māori Health Authority to get its system set up, and you couldn't uh, just throw the money at it in those first couple of years to you know really get uh, some decent funds pumping through into commissioning. But uh, I suspect it's one of these stories that will blow up quite big in the next few days Mm. because the Māori caucus have talked a good game about the Māori Health Authority and I suspect uh, they've been done over by Treasury and the uh, old DHBs in how this is being set up. Uh, That will be a very interesting one to keep an eye on. The it's actually the second lock-up I think you've been in, in, in this week, Bernard, because you, you were there for the emission reductions plan on Monday as well, were you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just slept under the desk. That was, that was really, really <laughs> and the, helpful. It was but, interesting watching that because, I mean, James Shaw, it was obviously a historic moment in terms of New Zealand's response to climate change, but it didn't look completely thrilled all the way through that. And it seemed like, seems like some of it had been, some of the good news had been saved up for today because we've seen that extension only by two months, but on the on the public transport uh, half price uh, reduction as well as the fuel excise cut that was included in today's announcements. That's right. Labor gets to give out the goodies, and James Shaw gets to swallow the rat. Mm. <laughs> That's the problem with this whole government. Actually, from a green point of view, is that. The government has used the Green Party to put a green gloss on a lot of the stuff it's done, Mm. but under the surface, it hasn't actually changed that much. And in my view, the emissions reduction plan that came out on Monday was a very damp squib. Mm. You know, we're talking only $1 billion in spending over the next two years. This is out of a fund that has already got billions and billions from the emissions uh, trading scheme. Mm -hmm. And in effect, the government is using the emissions trading scheme as a way to tighten fiscal policy and uh, hasn't spent much at all on public transport or on uh, shifting to electric vehicles. You know, we're only talking 2,500 cars in the clunkers for low emissions car scheme. And only if you look at the four years, you know, we're only talking, you know, 20 or 30,000 cars. It's not a huge change for a a country that's got 4.4 million smoky old cars, it's um, it's not a transformational change. And the government's effectively used that extra money from the emissions trading scheme to tighten fiscal policy, essentially to try and achieve its overall aims of keeping debt low and trying not to pump too much more inflation into the economy. Hey, one of the things that, uh, you know, the budget always gets its various kind of epithets laid out and the Ag Party leader, David Seymour, had come up with a one even before the the budget was unveiled, which was the brain drain budget, and something you've been writing about a little bit on your uh, on your Kaka newsletter recently. Do you think there's do you think there's any truth in characterising this budget or the general direction of travel as a, as a brain drain budget? Yeah, I think it's fair to say not just this budget, but pretty much everyone for the last thirty years has been <laughs> a brain drain budget, <laughs> because you know you've you've had a government. And councils, which have systematically for 30 years underinvested in infrastructure, and the end result was an explosion in housing costs mm. and also a continuation of low wages. So over that 30 years, you've seen the gap open up between Australian wages and New Zealand wages, and particularly in the last couple of years, the housing costs in Australia have actually gotten cheaper than here because they actually did invest in large numbers of new, new apartments and because their state governments are much more willing to invest in infrastructure than our councils are. And that's meant that the you've got really um, a perfect storm on the brain drain front. Anyone with some skills or talent who uh, just jumps on to seek.com.au as opposed to the .co.nz, we'll see enormous numbers of highly paid jobs where you get a pension, you get um, probably some medical insurance, and you get to uh, live in an apartment somewhere a little bit warmer for 100 bucks a, le- a week less, particularly if you're from Wellington. So it's, it's um, pretty attractive. And we've already seen in the numbers in the last couple of months as the borders opened up, a large number of of New Zealand residents, uh, often New Zealand uh, trained and educated uh, people between the ages of 20 and 30 have just jumped on a plane and gone to get themselves a juicy job mm. because Australia has the same school shortages that we do, in fact, even even tougher. And, you know, if you're, if you're someone 
also, you've been locked up for a couple of years. You'd quite like to go <laughs> go somewhere different. Yeah, and although you, can do it and you, you do also risk encounters with spiders and snakes and prime ministers who body check child football players for fun. So there's, it's not, it's not, it's not all smooth sailing. Hey, listen, the, I guess the big question for this, and and you know, not not that much longer than a year until we go go to the polls again. Is is this is this going to turn the dial in the political polls? Is this an election winning budget? I don't think so. I mean, only three hundred and fifty dollars as a one off doesn't really change things mm. for most people. Uh, I think the phone is increasingly off the hook for the government. People have stopped listening, and um, they're in a mood to essentially. Uh, put the successes of the first year of COVID well into the past. That's been banked. Mm. And now people are looking at their costs of living. They're looking at housing costs. They're looking at their potential future as to whether they can find themselves a home, whether they, their, their kids can get, get themselves a home on their own, uh, off their own bat. And, you know, for a lot of people, they're thinking, actually, not that much has really changed. We're still in the same situation Low wages, high housing costs, um, high inflation, still only two, two supermarket chains. Tasty cheese is 14 bucks a, a block. And the same chunk of cheese in Australia, literally with the same packaging mm. in a Woolworths, mm. is half the price. So for a lot of New Zealanders, they've gone through four years of a so-called transformational government. They've had the promises from the Prime Minister about uh, light rail lines and 100,000 Kiwi build. And four years on, not much has changed. And now they've got an opposition leader who they can listen to and um, they're not that grumpy with. And uh, with less than a year to go, you can see why the polls have national enact either governing on their own or close to it. And you can't, this, this budget won't turn things around. However, the government does have the next budget hmm. in May 2023, where you can see they're getting ready to throw the kitchen sink at it. And that was an answer from uh, Grant Robertson to one of my questions, which was, you know, they have 15 percentage points of GDP in that debt track. Yeah. So we're talking, you know, they could do tens of billions of dollars worth of spending in some form or another, either on infrastructure or on some sort of um, middle class uh, welfare thing. I, I get the feel of a 2005 when um, Cullen and actually uh, Grant Robertson were behind the um, interest-free student loans mm. thing that got them over the line that just, was a at, real, just at the last real minute. real rabbit out of a hat, that one, wasn't it? Yeah, so they, they have room for a, a bigger rabbit um, this time around next year and it might be more effective because by then inflation will be falling and uh, so will interest rates and the housing market will have stopped falling mm. and uh, maybe there will be a few more um, bruises and skid marks on Christopher Luxon to look at. I'm going to write that down here. Super giant budget 2023 called already <laughs> by Bernard Hickey. Bernard, last question. What were the snacks like in the lockup? Did they provide snacks for the hardworking men and women of the press gallery? Yeah, I'll let you in on a little secret. I'm on a diet. <laughs> Diet at the moment, and uh, so I'm not allowed to um, oh, no. partake. But Bernard. they look good. The sausage rolls. Uh, apparently, there is someone oh, in the press gallery oh, who, who was going to go for eight. It was some sort of record uh, profligate sausage roll eating thing. I feel terrible. Having glad I didn't you go. There. I feel <laughs> terrible now. He's, like, you can't see this, listeners, but Bernard is sort of falling out of frame. Where I can see him on the Zoom connection here. It's like his <laughs> neck has disappeared completely. And he's disappearing into his suit. And this is because he's not eating any sausage rolls. So yeah. this is a cry for I, help. I really love a good sausage roll too. They looked good. And there, there were croissants. Mm. There was even, you know, some sort of um, sticky bun. Uh, it was very frustrating. Thank you very much, Bernard. It was great to chat. And uh, when the facts change is coming back soon, so we're excited to get another fill of that weekly. You looking forward to that? Yeah, yeah, no, it'll be pure when the facts change and um, right back into pure. the whole political economy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I've enjoyed this crossover thing. You know, it's like like an SUV that um, mm. it's only two-wheel drive, yeah. but it's, it's a good one. Yeah. And, uh, or, or, and the other one I really love is the Ghostbusters, you know, the moment when the lines cross in Ghostbusters yes. and the world ends? yes. Yeah. Okay. That's promising thought. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe maybe we could do it again next budget. Um, where where my um the big bunny budget my uh, predict Bernie's big bunny budget live big bunny on budget. when the <laughs> lunchtime changes. 
All right, let's wrap it up. Yeah, That's yeah. enough. We're dissolving into absolute disaster. Thanks, Bernard. Lovely to see you. See you soon. Cheers. Uh, that was a very special edition of Gone by Lunch, The Facts Change. Uh, when the facts change, Kiwi Bank supported fantastic podcasts. We'll be back soon. Gone by Lunchtime. We'll be back, I suspect, next week. Who knows? Uh, thank you to members. Thank you to Zahir Butler. Thank you to Jane Yee. Kakiti. Talo for Lover. I'm Madeline Chapman, editor at The Spin Off. If you have the means, consider supporting our high quality journalism by becoming a Spin Off member. Sign up now at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. Kia ora, I'm Alex Casey, senior writer at The Spin Off. We wouldn't exist without the ongoing support of our generous members. If you're able to, you can make a donation at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The Spin Off Podcast Network.